Welcome to Shift with CJ. I'm your host CJ and together we will explore the areas of health, human performance, biohacking, psychology and much more that will inspire you to become the best version of yourself. If you listen to the classic advice, then sure, increasing your performance levels means grinding it out at the gym and then coming back tomorrow to grind some more. But most evidence only suggests that doing that is going to leave you inflamed, tired, and can cause honestly some other health issues. But what if there was a way to take on something as simple as like a power nap and get so many health benefits? Yes, that is possible when you think it from the aspect of biohacking and science. And today, I want to introduce you to one such invention. And to help you understand this, I have got an expert on the show. Today on the show, I have brought to you Dr. Jason Sonners, who's on a mission to lead change that transforms the health of our communities and for the generations to come. Hey, that's similar to what Shift with CJ, what we believe in Shift with CJ, basically. He's the clinic director of NJ Hyperbaric Oxygen Therapy and Hyperbaric Oxygen Therapy USA. Dr. Jason, welcome to the show. Hey, CJ, thank you so much for having me. I'm, I'm really excited to be able to share this information uh, with you and your audience. I am so glad that I can introduce all of this through an expert like you. Now, I believe you got onto this mission while you first started your training as a chiropractor. Am I correct? Or does this thing come after your training finished? Yeah, it was, uh, I was about a year or so into practice. Uh, my own, I had graduated, I had worked at an office for a little while, and then we had started our own practice, my wife and I, and it was about a year, year and a half into practice where, um, if you know the story where I had an injury that kind of led me down this road. Mm -hmm. I would like you to tell the audience just briefly about how you got introduced to the superpowers of hyperbaric. Sure. Yeah. So, uh, so like I was saying, I had, started our practice and I was, we had a small home office at the time and we were actually going to remodel the house and potentially, you know, flip the house and then move into another house. And we kind of thought, you know, I, I like to do things like that. And it was like a good side project. So it was uh, the middle of the winter and I had decided to put a new roof on our house. And so I was literally, you know, climbing up and by myself. And so I was just, you know, climbing up and down a ladder you know, with squares of shingles and, and re-roofing this house. And right in the middle of that process, I, I herniated a disc as I was climbing the ladder with the with two shingles. And so I had obviously, you know, searing back pain and then the whole, you know, sciatica, so like nerve pain down my, my whole right leg. And uh, needless to say, you know, obviously not finishing that roof in that time. And then I, I wasn't even practicing for a few weeks. I couldn't even, you know, stand on my feet. So my wife, also a chiropractor, she was treating me. And so the, the severeness of the back pain was gone probably in about two and a half weeks. But I was left with what's called drop foot. So I had literally no strength or motor control or feeling in my right foot from about like mid shin down through my toes. And, uh, you know, I had tried everything. <clears throat> my background is in exercise physiology and then nutrition and then chiropractic. So it's not like I didn't know what to do. I was you know, taking different um, natural anti-inflammatories. I was doing all the right exercises. I was getting treated and, and you know, chiropractic, massage, acupuncture. And, and at the time, nothing was bringing back my foot. We were also very active. I was doing triathlons at the time, but, you know, I couldn't do anything. I couldn't walk, let alone run. And so uh, it was really by chance I was at a chiropractic show where they had hyperbaric therapy and I, I didn't even know what it was. It just looked interesting. So I asked the guy if they were doing sessions and he said, yeah. So I tried a session. It was about 30 minutes. Uh, you know, I got in, laid down for a while, was breathing. You know, I didn't know what to expect. I got out. I started walking around the rest of this vendor hall. And all of a sudden, I was getting pins and needles in my foot. I hadn't felt my foot in about 18 months. Wow. And so I was like, wow, I wonder if, you know, what I'm feeling in my foot has something to do with that hyperbaric oxygen I just did. And uh, so the guy actually agreed to do a few sessions with me over the course of the weekend. And I left, I think I had done about six or seven hours in that time. And I had left with probably about 15, 20% uh, recovery in my foot. And so that was the first thing in all that time that had actually made any impact whatsoever. Uh, so I immediately actually bought one for my house to treat myself. And within a few months, uh, I had full resolution of that, that neuropathy. And which year was this in? How long back are we talking about? Uh, that was about 12 years ago, 13 years ago. 12 years. Wow. Yeah. I'm sure hyperbaric has come a long way from then. 
let me tell you what happened to me last year or was it about a year or two years two years ago so what happened to me was that i'm always been obsessed with new ways to push the human potential and boundaries and even though i consider myself to be healthy and fit i have this eagerness to try so many things and try the next big thing so one day i was in bangkok thailand with my cousin and we we're kind of like doing all the sightseeing in the temples we finish a sightseeing get on to one of these transport um things there called tuk tuk and to my cousin's surprise i did not take the name of the next temple but instead i took the name of a hospital and my cousin was like hey what are we getting into now so we walk into this hospital and there i'm for filling my form for hyperbaric oxygen therapy and my cousin's getting worried because he's like what the hell is this and at that point i'm just trying to reassure him and tell them that hey this thing is just going to give me a lot of oxygen and the next thing i see him do is freak out when they take us to a room full of a large chamber which honestly looked like a mini submarine yeah and they asked me to wear this mask and go inside and i can tell you jason how difficult it was to just make him understand and let me go in this is my cousin at that time i just told him it's really good for me and i was going to come out being super strong now i agree that is not a good definition but can you tell the audience how getting locked into a chamber is beneficial for you and what is hyperbaric oxygen sure yeah that's a great story i love that tj you know it is uh there there are many different kinds of chambers uh there's a lot of different ways that this could be applied in in the clinical setting and so you know you were i think you were inside a multi place chamber like more than one person was in this right oh, okay. yeah sure so uh the idea here is that uh when we breathe obviously you know the main reason that we're breathing is to absorb oxygen into our body and oxygen is ultimately uh i i use it as like it's like a nutrient you could also say it's it's part of a fuel source for all of our cells to function and to do well and the reason that when we breathe we're able to absorb oxygen is ultimately because we have an atmosphere so surrounding us is an atmosphere that atmosphere creates pressure and so i live at sea level and at sea level the pressure of the atmosphere is let's just call it about 15 psi so when i breathe at 15 psi i could get fully saturated with oxygen if you ever been to the doctor and they put that pulse oximeter on your finger it tells you you know how much oxygen your red blood cells have so for the most part Okay yeah. So uh you know for the most part, you know if if you have no lung issues and no heart issues, when we breathe, the the pressure of the atmosphere allows us to saturate our red blood cells near 100%. Now, the opposite will will go this way first. When you go to elevation, so if you were to go to a mountain, uh on that elevation, you would find it harder to breathe. And the reason for that is ultimately there's less pressure as you go up in elevation and the pressure is the driving force for oxygen absorption so as we lose pressure we lose that that driving force to force oxygen into our tissues from our lungs with each breath and now the opposite is true if you were to increase the pressure that is going to increase the driving force for oxygen which means let's say right now you know i said i was at 15 psi if i was to go to 20 or 30 psi that would be an increased pressure and now all of a sudden my body is going to absorb you know some percentage more depending on how much pressure of oxygen directly into the blood and so inside these chambers really what's happening is you're just creating um a pressurized environment and that pressurized environment temporarily is going to allow for this massive increase in oxygen absorption without it without increasing the pressure of the environment you're in the atmosphere of, of in other words uh there's really no way to ever get more than 100% saturated so if you're living right now let's say we put a pulse oximeter on your finger and we got 98% saturation and then we got 100% oxygen and you were breathing that through a mask we'd be able to get you from 98% to 100% so maybe 2% more in a hyperbaric environment because you're pressurizing the the air and the environment that you're actually in instead of only going to 100% you're actually going to bypass the red blood cell carrying capacity and you're able to absorb exponentially more oxygen so somewhere between on the low end 
30 to 50% more, but on the higher end, 15 times or 18 times more oxygen absorption inside the hyperbaric environment than whatever environment we're typically living at. And so when your body has access to this increased reservoir of oxygen, it's literally creating uh, this reservoir of excess oxygen that all of your cells will be able to use for whatever purpose that your cells need a little boost in that fuel. And for the audience, if you don't know what ATP is, it is called adenosine triphosphate, which is basically the energy energy currency of life. And if you want to do, if you want to get more energy into everything that you're doing, like let's say breathing, running, um, lifting that weight, or studying for the exam, you need a lot of ATP. And one way you can increase your ATP is just it oxygen. And as Dr. Saunders is saying, if you get into that chamber, chances are you're going to push the boundary of your ATP production. Just imagine all that energy, how much can you use in so many different aspects of your life. And then I also was very thrilled to learn about all the benefits about getting into, at least for my experience, a scary looking chamber. I fully understood at that point, what are some of the benefits and my problem was at that point, I couldn't explain to my cousin, who's not very passionate about health, on some of the more extensive benefits. Now, I think our audience is also super excited and might be a bit confused. So, Dr. Jason, can you run over just a few of the uh, benefits that come from going into a hyperbaric chamber? Anything that you could think of? Absolutely. So I want to touch on a little bit of what you had just mentioned previously, because that'll take us into some of those benefits, okay? Uh, what you had said was, you know, ultimately oxygen plays this role. It has so many different um, avenues in which it could help affect our, our chemistry in a positive way, one of which being a ATP production or energy production. So uh, an example that I like to use is, you know, a car and the, and the motor in the car. OK, and this I think this will help people understand how powerful this is, because the the engine or the motor that's in charge of ultimately creating power to move that car forward or backward or whatever it needs to do. And in order for that to happen, there needs to be combustion. And in order for combustion to occur, you basically need a fuel source and something to oxidize and to literally create mini explosions. And through those explosions and through that combustion, is the process of energy formation. Inside every one of our cells, it's exactly the same. You need a fuel source, and that could be glucose or fat. And there are reasons why one you, you might choose one fuel versus the other. But you need a fuel source like glucose or fat, and then you need oxygen. And through the combination of ultimately breaking down the sugar or fat and combining it with oxygen, you get combustion. And that combustion creates energy in our body, as you said, that's ATP. Now, what do you do to a car, or there's a few things you could do to a car to improve its performance. One is you can choose better fuel sources. So we know that you know a cleaner, more powerful fuel will certainly allow that engine to burn cleaner and more powerfully. We can do the same thing. Another thing we can do to that car is put a cold air intake into the engine, which means you're going to drive more oxygen into the engine. And when you drive more oxygen into the engine, you're going to create more power that that engine can produce. And again, humans can do the same thing, except the only way to do that currently is through increasing the pressure of the air that we're breathing. And that's where hyperbaric plays that big role. Okay. So, you know, going in a chamber to me is like putting that air intake on a car. You're driving a tremendous more oxygen into the uh, into the chamber that's being mixed with fuel. 
The part of our cell that does that is called a mitochondria. And so the mitochondria is in charge, is, the, is literally the motor, is the engine of our cells, and it's in charge of creating that power and that energy. And so taking that conversation into what are the benefits of hyperbaric, and there are so many, but one of them is that you can make the mitochondria more efficient and more powerful. But another really important thing is that you could increase the number of mitochondria that your body actually has. So after you've been exposed to higher than normal oxygen levels over a period of time, your body will recognize that and not want to waste any of that extra oxygen. So you'll start building more mitochondria so that you could actually produce even more energy. It's imagine you had a car and you wanted it to go faster. So you changed the fuel, you added the air intake, and now you have five or six engines instead of just one. If that's the equivalent of what our body does in response to this oxygen. And so as your body's creating more efficient, stronger, and now more mitochondria, the amount of power output that could be created in that environment is enormous. And so that's one of my favorite benefits from a performance um, and a cellular, even just not just life performance, like that would show up in exercise, that would show up as you know, focus and concentration. The uh, way you show up in the world, everything, how much pissed you get in traffic. I mean, it just gives you so exactly. much more resiliency. Exactly. So that's one of, in terms of my opinion, that's one of my favorite uh, mm -hmm. benefits, but there are many more. So a few of the other benefits that this may, uh, it kind of goes back to this. There's, there's a handful of mechanisms, no matter who you are and what may or may not be wrong with a person going into the chamber. Everybody who gets exposed to this increased pressure and increased oxygen environment, there are about 10 or 11 things that happen to everybody in that, in that mode. So you'll see things like increased white blood cell activation, which means now you're gonna get a better immune response. And in a time like this, that's a critical thing. Uh, you'll get a decrease in, in global inflammation. You'll get an increase in um, ATP, mitochondria, all that that we were just talking about. You'll also get an increase in stem cell activation. So basically new cells that need to replace old cells so that your body can continue to replace itself and heal over time. Um, you get an increase in uh, nerve healing. You get an increase in blood vessel, either blood vessel healing and or you'll, your body will actually start to make new blood vessels also in response to this extra oxygen so that it can carry this oxygen more efficiently. So the thing is this, what's interesting about our body is that every cell type, like your liver is a cell type, right? Your intestines, your brain. So we have lots of different systems and in each of our systems, there's different types of cells and every cell needs energy to do whatever job it does. So when we're talking about the engine of the cell, your liver has an engine, you know, a cell and uh, an engine in each little cell, but your liver's job, let's say, is simplified is to detoxify your body. So now all of a sudden you need energy for detoxification that your liver cells will use that extra oxygen for that purpose. Your brain cells send messages back and forth. So they need energy to send those messages and make those connections. So now your brain cells are going to get increased oxygen so that they can do that job better. Your intestines need energy to absorb nutrients and to help you get rid of waste. So when they get oxygen and their motor gets turned up, you'll get improved intestinal health. So the way it shows up is it shows up as increasing energy for all your different cells and all the different jobs that they have. And now as a result, you start to improve your body's ability to perform and adapt to the environment you're living in. Um, and you're getting just better function, period, across the board. So I hope that explains the majority of, of uh, those benefits. Yes, it does. And I'm so glad that you brought some of the most important things up. Like um, I have another story to tell you. Sure. Long back when I did not have a website and I did not have YouTube and probably not the podcast for sure, um, I was always feeling bad that I'm not able to share important pieces of information. And that led to the generation of the website and the whole idea about the podcast. And the way I used to share information about anything that I would learn or anything that would caught, catches my interest was with Instagram. So what I used to do was have Instagram stories. But the problem with Instagram is that Instagram doesn't give you so much of space to type, especially not in stories. 
So most of my family and my friends would always get confused. And the one thing they would keep asking me about is like, why do you always mention this term mitochondria? And the most of them were even asking me if you're pronouncing it right. And most of them were just pronouncing it weirdly. And for the most part of my life, I had a very like strong interest in mitochondria and how mitochondria impact your health. So thank you so much for bringing that up and sharing with my friends at that time who were probably listening to this. Well, I hope you're listening to this, that mitochondria are like engines or power plants. And the, if you can treat them right, if you can make them work properly, they're going to produce enormous amounts of energy that can help you with anything in your life. Absolutely. You know, I think the, at the, at the, as we look in the research of a lot of different diseases, we look for commonality. Like what do they have in common that if we could just help one or two areas of a person's body, that that would have five or six or seven different impacts. And so one of these one of these common denominators is what's called mitochondrial dysfunction. So ultimately, if your mitochondria, and this is true for things um, autism and spectrum related disorders, uh, a lot of autoimmunity, neurodegenerative diseases, a lot of these really terrible chronic and chronic degenerative diseases, the thing one of the things in common is that they all have this mitochondrial dysfunction and. If we can improve mitochondrial dysfunction and improve, by mitochondrial biogenesis, yeah, that is creation yeah. of new mitochondria. Yes. So if we can create that in somebody's body, all of a sudden they have tremendous shifts in their health. And so that's become a very large, for me, a very large target of, you know, how do we do that? Because if we can, and I know that we can, um, you know, we can really help these people quite a bit. Yes, definitely. And one of the other things that we can be using to help people better is something that you just touched about, which is either having these nerve healing factors or development of new blood vessels, which is angiogenesis. Now, I want to let the audience know that there are many of these nerve healing factors that you can actually focus on. One of them is called VEGF, um, BDNF, and HIF1. So if people are kind of confused, doctor, on all of these terms, which are these nerve healing factors, do you want to tell them just what do they mean at least? Sure. Yeah. I mean... And I can jump in anytime. Sure. You know, I, I never know the audience, so I don't go down those roads right out of the gate. But if you'd like mm -hmm. to, I'm happy to. <laughs> um, you know, really what happens when you heal or your body's just trying to improve its performance there's all kinds of signaling that has to occur. So your brain has to tell your body what to do. Your body has to communicate with nearby cells to tell, you know, everybody, keep everybody on the same page so everybody knows what the plan is, you know? And so we use all of these different signaling factors. So, um, you know, HIF-1 or HIF-1-alpha, that's a hypoxic induction factor, um, epithelial factors, brain-derived neurotropic factors, you know, the ones that you're mentioning. What these are, these are uh, chemical messengers to tell your cells, hey, help is on the way, and we're going to start building, let's say with VEGF, we're going to start building new highways to carry more oxygen. And so these are, they're like stimulating chemicals that start a process of initiating a healing response. And each of those healing responses, each of those chemicals has a different name depending on, you know, where in the body it is, whether it's, you know, uh, a fibroblast or a capillary or, um, you know, a nerve cell. So depending on which cells we're stimulating, we have different names for these chemical messengers, but ultimately they're signaling factors. And uh, HIF-1-alpha, uh, hypoxic induction factor, the guys uh, who basically, you know, discovered that and really studied it, they won the Nobel Prize in medicine last year in 2019 mm -hmm. uh, for the, for its discovery, because what we found out is that they're basically, you know, O2 sensors. They're, they're basically oxygen sensors throughout our body. And as they're measuring the oxygen levels, they're 
trying to help the body adapt to these increases or decreases of oxygen. For the most part, we're looking at them from hypoxia, low oxygen levels, because so many of these chronic illnesses, cancer, autoimmunity, when we have high inflammation, we have low oxygenation. And so, you know, they're studying that from that standpoint. I look at it like, you know, the body's really just trying to absorb as much oxygen as it can and deliver it in as many different places as we can in order to maintain the combustion that every cell needs to perform properly. And as our body goes through, let's say in the hyperbaric environment, when you're inside the chamber, you're stimulating that those sensors and you're telling the body, hey, here comes a whole lot of extra oxygen. And then when you get out of the chamber, believe it or not, as that oxygen's leaving your body, those same receptors are stimulated and they actually think that the body's becoming hypoxic. It's not. It still has more oxygen than it, than it would have normally had. But because the pressure is, is reducing and so oxygen is leaving, it mm-hmm. signals those same receptors as if the body was hypoxic. And so some of the benefits of hyperbaric oxygen happen because you're inside the chamber but also many of the benefits of hyperbaric oxygen happen when you get out of the chamber. And that, that signaling of, of HIF-1 alpha back and forth seems to be one of the most important uh, relationships that hyperbaric has on all of the different health related benefits we see as a result of hyperbaric. I would definitely say that after leaving that chamber, I did, um, Like as the day progressed, I first started feeling a little uncomfortable, but then my energy levels were through the roof. I remember I did not sleep very well before going into the chamber and two hours or an hour and a half right after coming out of the chamber, it was like I've been sleeping for 12 or 13 hours. Now, I mentioned these nerve healing factors again, because I want people to know that small things like these, or there are things that people probably haven't heard about. I'm not sure if the audience completely knows about this, but just to put the word out there that there are these small things which we probably ignore or don't know about, but they're key to absolute performance or whether it's something as simple as learning a new skill or feeling much healthy as Dr. Saunders said, because now you had more blood vessels. And it's also very important as you age I mean, even if you're young and if you have, like like me, you have some kind of an anti-aging regime or something like that, this could be like a very important hack for all of you. Like let's say BDNF, for example, right? It's brain-derived neurotrophic factor. And this is something that can probably make you super, if not super smart, but at least switched on even when you're like 90 or 100. And there are like natural things that you can do to increase BDNF, things like sleeping well because when you're sleeping that's the time bdnf releases meditation or anything that you do can reduce stress can also do this also exercise which a lot of people don't think about exercise is not only good for your muscles but some kind of exercise like endurance exercise has also shown to increase a specific protein in the body which is fndc5 which stands for fibronectin type 3 domain something protein it's, it's something like this. It's a bit complicated. But all I know is that if you do some kind of endurance exercise, that can increase BDNF by 300%. And the other things that we spoke about, such as um, VEGF and hypoxic indu- inductible factor, you can even do this. I've written this previously on my blog where you can use special bands, which you tie around your legs and hands. These are basically blood flow restriction bands and they act like tourniquets. And the way they work is by limiting blood, which also causes some kind of an oxygen deprivation in the working muscle. And it increases this capacity of your micro vessels and increases VEGF and like even the receptors that VEGF attaches to HIF-1-alpha and various nitric oxide synthesis. So the thing is, there are so many ways to increase performance and increase all of these growth factors and healing factors. You just have to like, kind of get interested and learn a bit about them or else you can just go to a hyperbaric chamber and you can skip all that information. You know, 
even a combination, you know, like I, I use and recommend to a lot of people blood flow restrictive training because there are so many benefits. You know, when the body thinks that it's becoming hypoxic, that's a that's a huge problem for the body to have that. So the amount of effort and energy that will go into what do I need to do to get more oxygen to this area of my body? You know, the, the body will go through such tremendous adaptation and those adaptations, assuming that they're temporary, those adaptations will actually stick around after the, after the fact. So you do this blood flow restrictive training, you get all these hormone releases, you get all these growth factor releases, exactly. um, and then you take the bands off. Well, those growth factors and hormones are still there. So you get this tremendous uh, benefit from your capacity to heal and regenerate tissue. And that's what that's what most of it's about to me. And then you don't even have to become like go by blood flow restriction or do all this. Just breathing itself. If you breathe like, you know, you breathe in some of the most ancient ways that we've been talking about. And so many people have come forward and they have spoken about releasing your breath quite slowly where you build this back pressure of carbon dioxide and carbon dioxide is responsible for letting the oxygen disassociate from your hemoglobin, which means that the oxygen can fall into cells much easily if you have a little bit of buildup of carbon dioxide. So sometimes you can just take simple steps and it can really help you gain advantage with oxygen. Now, let's talk about some of the history behind hyperbaric chamber. Now, from what I know, it's been around for a very long time. And in my research, I found out that there was this British physician who did this in 1662. Um, and at that point, it was called a docilium. But I cannot even imagine how big and weird looking chamber must be there in 1662. <laughs> Why do you think they kind of like, like, what was the thought process of getting all of this together? Did the physicians or the scientists or the inventors at that time, did they completely understand what they were getting into? And that's why perhaps they made something like this. Was there an inspiration? Did they, I don't know, like, did they look at these people who were climbing mountains and coming back with more red blood cells? And what do you think happened? So, I mean, it goes back, it even goes back further um, <clears throat> to like BC era. Oh, wow. And, <clears throat> excuse me. So, so when it goes back that far, a lot of these folks were really trying to get underwater. You know, so much of hyperbaric medicine is based out of um, derivatives of scuba diving and, you know, uh, long periods underwater or just humans wanting to experience, you know, what is under the ocean floor. So a lot of these earlier ones were trying to pressurize people in some sort of vessel so that they could explore, uh, you know, different underwater environments. And, and then in other variations above, like what you're mentioning in, in Europe, they weren't sure. They, they just thought, hey, we could manipulate pressure and so in, in some cases, they were creating hypoxic environments. And, they, and then in other cases, hyperoxic environments like hyperbaric. And honestly, they had no, we had no idea. They had no idea what they were doing. <laughs> they just knew that changes in pressure seemed to have, you know, things like changes in energy levels or changes in you know, whether it was like a little bit of inflammation, but it never really took off, you know, as, as to your point, it's been around a long time. And yet, even now, as we talk about it, people are like, hyper what, yeah, you know, exactly. so it's an interesting phenomenon. But I, what I would say is that um, in the, like the late 1800s, early 1900s is really when it started picking up and uh, they were you. You know, at, at those times, they were finding out about specifically issues like the bends, you know, so decompression sickness from uh, people who were uh, building bridges and, and basically staying in these underwater pressurized environments 
you know, and then when they were finished work, they would just shoot straight up to the top and get out. And then they were having all these crazy neurologic problems as a result. And so they started to figure out that they had to recompress them. You know, a lot of these people, they would feel great at work and then they would feel awful when they got home. And then when they got to go to work the next day, they'd feel great again. And so they were seeing that when they got repressurized, you know, there seemed to be some benefit to that. And that was really what started the science of understanding the result of, you know, pressure, nitrogen, oxygen, all these things in our body. But, you know, only even early, you know, actually later than that was people who were getting recompressed in these chambers they were getting resolution of whatever problems they were having, but they were also finding other benefits. And so people started saying, wow, you know, I went in for this problem, but as a result, this also got better. And so that, that became the curiosity of, wait, what else is, you know, this possible, you know, doing to these people. And so like many things, it's, it's transitioned from, uh, you know, mostly unknown, but seeming to have some benefits to, you know, being able to treat some pretty severe issues like decompression illness or, you know, uh, gas embolisms, you know, and then all of a sudden realizing how well it does with wound care and how quickly it could help, you know, the, the tissue because, you know, chronic wounds are chronically hypoxic. They don't have enough oxygen. So when we saturate that tissue with oxygen, all of a sudden these wounds heal and then you carry that forward and you say, well, listen, the same mechanisms that are helping these people with these neurologic issues or with these wounds that are, aren't healing properly without that same level of intensity of treatment, but that same principle of increased pressure and increased oxygen, if we could heal massive wounds, couldn't we just help the body regenerate a little bit better on some ongoing basis where a little bit of extra pressure and a little bit of extra oxygen could just help that human recover and perform better even in their life without having to have some type of, you know, serious condition to benefit from. So, you know, over the last 10 years, especially, we've seen that transition of, you know, treating pretty tough illnesses like bone infections, gangrene, you know, these chronic wounds, diabetic neuropathy, all of these all of a sudden saying, well, they also help other conditions like post-stroke recovery, um, you know, uh, other neuropathies besides diabetic neuropathy. Like in my case, that's what I had. I had a neuropathy from an injury. So it helps to heal these, you know, also terrible to have, but a little less severe conditions. And then you could take that one more step forward and say, you know, hey, if you use this thing on some regular basis, not maybe not as high a pressure, not as high an oxygen level, but increased relative to what we normally get, couldn't I also improve my health and or potentially slow or even reverse, you know, some of the aging process that we all that we're all exposed to. And sure enough, you know, in the last couple of years, especially you know, the research has been saying, absolutely, that's true. And, uh, you know, we're seeing it in the clinics all over the world now. That is completely like, I couldn't say this better. Like, thank you for saying that it is one of the most powerful interventions that can come in through human curiosity and science, which can affect so many diseases. Now talking about a disease last year, I saw a paper by the name of this doctor, let me try to get his name right. His name is Zong Yangling, and he's the director of the hyperbaric oxygen in Wuhan. And he published a report saying demonstration report on inclusion of hyperbaric oxygen therapy to treat people with COVID cases, serious COVID cases. And he has quite a success rate with hyperbaric oxygen therapy and treating this virus. Have you seen anything like this in your practice or with any of your friends? Sure. So <clears throat> even in the U S there's been, there's been movements and conversation. Um, I was involved with a few between in the U S with a few hospitals. Also, um, in Europe, they were trying to figure out if hyperbaric might be as good or possibly even better therapy for an acute COVID case. There's a great, 
case to be made for it. And there's a handful of studies that I know of around the world, uh, one in France, one in Israel, one in California, I think two in New York, one in Louisiana, all right now ongoing and looking at the use of hyperbaric for acute COVID cases. And, you know, the main mechanism here is that when the, I'm sure your listeners, you've heard the, the term, this cytokine storm that occurs, yes. which basically means this massive increase in inflammation, mm-hmm. along with, you know, all of this, uh, so fluid inflammation and debris that accumulates in the lung tissue, these patients get uh, very hypoxic very quickly. And early on, you know, we were looking at that from a more typical pneumonia standpoint and using ventilators. And unfortunately, you know, ventilators didn't turn out to work as well as we had hoped. And, you know, the, the death rate of patients ending up on ventilators was still very high. And so people were looking for different options. And there have been a bunch of cases throughout, especially, like I was saying, the U.S. and Europe, I know, uh, where in small groups, they were exposing people to hyperbaric instead of ventilators and getting amazing results. And the real reason here is that it's the same idea. We're just trying to increase oxygen. However, if, if there's a barrier that's preventing the oxygen from crossing lung tissue and getting into uh, circulation, we need to drive more oxygen in. A ventilator helps us breathe. Like if you cannot inhale and exhale, the ventilator will help you inhale and exhale. And the pressure stays the same. But the pressure of the gas stays the same, Mm -hmm. right? So the pressure of your lungs increases, but the pressure of the gas stays the same. In a hyperbaric environment, the pressure of your lungs will stay the same. In other words, you're able to breathe in and out. However, the pressure of the gas is what increases. And ultimately, as we started this conversation, we were talking about the difference between elevation and going to depth, and that's creates this driving force. That driving force of increased pressure is what, you know, gas or anything moves from high concentration to low concentration down its concentration gradient. So the higher the concentration gradient of oxygen is, the more likely you'll get molecules of oxygen going from high concentration to low. And so as we increase the environmental oxygen level, and the oxygen in your body is actually decreasing because you can't get enough oxygen, the difference between how high the high oxygen level is and how low the low oxygen level is in your body, that, that differentiation is what creates the gradient that allows the gas to move in that direction. So 100%, I think there's a huge space for it in acute COVID. And what I would say is now more than ever, even in our clinic, we're seeing usage of hyperbaric in what's considered this these post covid consequences these you know so called long haulers that are left with a multitude of chronic symptoms even long after the acute infection has worn off and a lot of these are in continued issues with you know gas exchange so they're you know fatigue and not being able to get not feeling like they're able to get enough oxygen but there's also a lot of neurologic issues that seem to be longer lasting after uh, after exposure to COVID. And so uh, I think I think in addition to it being a, a very good source for acute COVID, it's going to turn out that it's also in a great alternative therapy for some of these post COVID cases and these chronic cases that just need a little bit more oxygen so that the body could heal better. And I'm so glad I spoke to you because I don't know if the listeners really know, but right now I'm in quarantine because I've had COVID. I'm going to go for my re-PCR test in the next two days. Mm-hmm. But yeah, I think I should um, start looking into some of these other long-term issues that come with COVID. And yeah, um, you know, I mean, I'd and probably not- get in touch with you if I need any help just oh, absolutely. to navigate. Of course. And yeah. um, doctor, we're coming to the end of this podcast. I just need to ask a few questions. So I'll do this like a rapid fire round. I'll just throw those at you and you can give me the shortest answer possible. You got it. So how many sessions are required in a typical hyperbaric chamber? Like is it one, 10, 15? I've even heard like 60 sessions. 
So uh, unfortunately, I'll give you a short answer, but there's really no short answer to that. Okay. It's very, it's so dependent on how much pressure you're using, how much oxygen you're using, how much time. Those are the three variables that we have to manipulate with hyperbaric. And then what's the goal? How either is this a performance type phenomenon? Is this a you know moderately ill phenomenon? Is that a very sick person? So you have to try to match the right type of equipment, how much pressure, how much oxygen you're using, and then how severe is this case or you know what are the goals in terms of performance? So on the low end, I would say somewhere between five and 10 sessions, people start really noticing and feeling some differences. Mm -hmm. But on the long end, some really chronic illnesses, people could do hundreds, you know, in in some cases, people purchase these chambers, they put them in their home, I have one in my home, um, you know, more for like wellness and well being, but, Mm -hmm. and, you know, I've done, I've done 1000s of hours over the last, you know, 12 or 13 years, for sure. And so, uh, you know, ultimately, you're matching, what's the goal with, you know, what equipment are we using? And we take it from there. But the average is probably somewhere between 20 and 40 hours. I've had my eyes on one of those chambers for the longest period of time. And last year, I actually started saving up a little bit before COVID hit to get one of those soft chambers. Yeah. Now, how much for someone who's listening, what are the costs? Like how much does it cost to probably attend um, a hyperbaric session in one of your local healthcare communities? And how much does it cost to get one of these wellness chambers that you have in your house? So um, it's a pretty wide range. In the U.S., I would say it ranges on the low end around $100 an hour. On the high end, like three to $500 an hour. Okay. Um, I'd say most places are somewhere in between like $150 to $200 kind of thing. But it, I've seen a pretty wide range around here. In general, hospitals in the U.S. won't treat anybody with these issues. So we, we have private clinics and then we have like insurance-based clinics. Insurance-based clinics will not treat wellness or even other like stroke or neuropathies. They really only treat the other ones like the gangrene and the osteomyelitis and the wounds. Mm-hmm. Uh, in terms of home chambers, you know, it runs the gamut and, and there's, a, there's quite a few manufacturers out there. There's, I have to say that you have to be careful because, you know, you are going in a pressurized environment and while I love it and I think it's amazing and I'm a huge proponent, I have seen some, you know, less than desirable pieces of equipment out there. And Mm -hmm. as, as much as a chamber can help you in your journey of health and or performance and wellness, you know, these things could also hurt you if they're not built properly or if you don't know how to use them. So I do love the home unit. I think that they're great for what they are good for, um, but making sure that you're getting one that's built well and will keep you safe is as important as all the benefits that you might get from them. So uh, I've seen quite a few in the four to five, 6,000 range, and I've seen quite a few issues with ones around there. Um, I'd say the average price for a decent chamber would probably be somewhere around like 10 or 12,000 U.S., um, but I've also seen them go all the way up to 50, 60, 70,000. So, wow. you know, depending on so many variables, uh, but usually somewhere around that, like 10 to 12,000, you could, you could get a pretty good home chamber, um, that would be safe and effective. All right. Thank you, doctor. Now, everyone who's listening, please go ahead. And if you're, if it's safe to do so. Type in hyperbaric chamber on your mobile devices because that's the best way to search and then learn a little bit about it. If you want, you can go back to this podcast, play the recording one more time, take some notes and we're off for today. Dr. Jason, I thank you so, so much. I really appreciate what you are doing in the world. You are a felt of knowledge and I'm so happy that you could come on today's show and share that piece of knowledge with our audience. What's the best way to find you if one of our audience members wants to just, you know, check you out on their mobile phones? What's the best way? Is it your website? Is it um, something? Yeah, else? I think um, we have a few clinics, obviously, but um, uh, we have one in New Jersey, one in Pennsylvania, and we we partner with some people 
uh, in the U.S. around also. But in terms of education and just learning more, our main website, which is H- hbotusa.com, H-B-O-T-U-S-A.com. And then we have our YouTube channel. And there's, I don't know, there's a hundred some odd videos on there. Um, and the channel is HBOTUSA as well. Uh, and, and that's just a great place uh, to learn more about the science, the research, how it works, why it works. Um, and through HBOTUSA.com, if people wanted to reach out to me directly, uh, if they had certain questions or anything like that, I most certainly could do that. Well, thank you so much for your time and take care. Yeah, you're very welcome, CJ. Thank you and for everything you're doing. Thank you. Today on the show, I have brought to you Your time and presence with us through this podcast is highly appreciated. If you want to learn more, then head over to our website, www.shiftwithcj.com.